Previously on The Sean Ryan Show. I said, this is going to sound odd, but I said, I used to live here. She goes, you did? She goes, who was your dad? And I told her. She goes, my stepfather. She said, I bought this house from him. And now we're just standing there. It's awkward. And she goes, bad things happened here, didn't they, son? He put me in a vehicle and drove me to an abandoned house. When we walked in, there was another fella. There was a hole cut through the wood floor and then a dirt hole. I was seven years old. People who don't understand it, you don't run. You don't tell. And I'm looking at the hole, and trust me, enough stuff had happened where I thought, well, this is the day he's just going to kill me. With everything you've been through as a child, when did God come into your life? You guys are saving kids all over the world now. Yeah. You know, what just... This morning, I, we were talking about you are going into ISIS, Islamic State territory, yeah. and saving kids. You know, and so how did it develop in, from a, <clears throat> maybe not from, maybe in addition to a ministry? Yep. How did it come from being a ministry for kids in prison to going overseas in Iraq, Syria, wherever you go. Yeah. How many places have you gone? How many How many countries? Gosh. I think I mean I was actually I've never counted. But I was kind of looking at it. We're probably 30 countries? 30 countries. Yeah. Can you rattle a couple off? Oh, uh, yeah, from Iraq, doing work in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, to um, the Palestinian-controlled areas, to the Far East and um, Burma, Myanmar, you know, Thailand, Cambodia, um, the U.S., everywhere, but then Mexico, Panama, Guatemala. Latin Down, America, yeah, Colombia, um, and there are there are definitely other places that we're uh, Tunisia, Northern Africa, Southern Africa. I mean, there's a lot, and it's like we we've never really paused. We keep analytics, and you know what are our what are our outcomes? Because impacts matter, but outcomes. But we've just um, we had somebody tell us. You know, a couple of years ago, it's like, do y'all celebrate your wins? I'm like, yeah, by going after another one. Yeah, we don't, we, our tempo, we don't need to pause for however long and just kind of, because there's more, there's always more. You know, I don't think anybody that's doing things for a higher purpose celebrates their wins. The <laughs> only people I see celebrating their wins are athletes, which is essentially for nothing. Yeah. It's entertainment. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, transparent, personally, I don't even focus on the kids we've helped. I just, I think about the ones we, we didn't. There's no time for celebrating when the shit's for real. Man, it, that, that's bored people or funky organizations. You know, it's like, I don't, how do y'all have time to do all that? I mean, I give you a perfect example. I mean, last month, <laughs> we have some guests come to the training center. They pull up their fifth well, they do marriage stuff, and uh, we're visiting with them. They're going to stay, oh, you know, a week. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they see me out in the yard with my dogs or drinking coffee on the deck. And and then I, I go up to them one, one afternoon. I said, hey, I just need to let y'all know, uh, Eileen and I, we have to go somewhere for a couple of days. 
uh, we'll be back. Just help yourself out and stuff, whatever. And then um, we come back, and they were talking to him, and they're like, because uh, they were on the podcast, and they go, can we just say something? I'm like, sure. They go, they go, hey, folks, maybe sometime you think what's being posted or on their website is sensationalized. They go, because it doesn't sound real sometimes. And it makes you, she goes, we're here visiting with them. And they tell us they have to go do something. They'll be back in a couple of few days. They leave the country. They go rescue a girl. They bring her back. And she's here in their safe house on the property. And we just met her. And they're like, you, and it was just you two. None of the other team got involved. I said, well, we had a we had a jet waiting. You know, and and you know, team set up stuff, but it was a two person team. It's it's we it was the best fit for us to go. And they were just like, Y'all act like this is normal, like nothing. You just went to the grocery shop on your back. There's no I go. And I mean my wife were we're going, uh is it that normal to us? Um, and even a couple of our staff were laughing. They're like, "Yeah, this is this is their norm. They don't go, woo, yeah." It's like, okay, now next step, and it's part of our life. It's part of our tempo. But um, and there's more coming, man. Let's go through. Let's get specific because I don't. You're not conveying. the danger and the sacrifice and the horrific stuff that you're witnessing. I want to bring that out. Mm. So let's, let's go into, let's just talk about some of the safe houses and some of the stuff that you've seen when saving kids from ISIS prison camps. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the whole mission planning cycle. Like, what is what is step one? Where do you get your intelligence from? We we have an incredible network. I'll say that first and foremost. It's like any intelligence group. It's a network, and uh, it's trusted, and it, we're it's very accurate. Um, give you an example. Uh, there was a gentleman in Iraq that wanted to meet with me. Um, he he is an influencer to about three hundred million Muslims. Uh, we call him the professor. And uh, there were people in lead agencies in all the top eight said, no one can get a meeting with this guy. He wants to meet with you. And I said, I ain't the guy. you know. And just so people know, we've never taken any money or resources from our government or any government. Have we relayed information that helped in certain situations? Absolutely. And, um, you know, have they helped us? I'll give you a great example. So this guy, he wants to meet with me. I said, why does he want to meet with me? Um, They said, he's watched you for two years. And he says, you actually care about the kids. And this guy, al-Baghdadi, asked him to be their spiritual leader. So maybe that's going to put in perspective for some people. Um, But no one could get a meeting with him. And uh, he's from Fallujah. And, you know, uh, super influential. So we flew in. It was a 72-hour mission. We was down and up 72 hours out of the country. And um, and I, um, we had to be our own QRF. We have to be our own medics. We we're we're totally self-contained, which means if things go sideways, we will not rely on anybody to get us, and we we wouldn't put anybody in harm's way. So how many how many guys are on? How many people are on a team with you? It depends on what's specific to the mission. Okay, um, we've done two. To 20. 
Okay. Uh, and but again, layered and redundancy for who, what, when, how. And um, our head of security, um, the Iraqi, when we're there, and but also works with the FBI agency work, and he's never charged me a penny. Never, I, I've offered. He's like, no way. And he actually became an American citizen. Uh, Esquire magazine did an article on him, said he was the most wanted man by terrorists in the world. So kept his face and name out of it. And he was with the unit for a long time. And he still does stuff. Um, so as a matter of fact, I'm looking at, you know, just a, a side note. When we started going over there and hammering it out, because we, um, in the last eight years, been there 17 times. So 17 pumps into wherever, for whatever we're doing, uh, over 100 missions complete. Uh, with trauma care or help, over 45,000 women and children. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And right into ISIS confinement camps, uh, Al Hall, with my wife, leading a team in. Um, but our head of security, he, he <laughs> the stuff we were doing, he was blown away, especially because he helped set up that meeting with the professor. And he, he goes, Victor, I want you to have this. And he wanted to give me Azakawi's AK that they pulled off of him out of, you know, when he got his feelings hurt. And he goes, this is mine, but I want you to have it because you're here doing this stuff. And I was like, thank you. I'm honored. I said, but I've got my own. I, it's tricked out to me. And I'm thinking that thing may have some juju on it, man. I'm not... <laughs> And he goes, but, well, let me at least give you drums. I said, why drums? He goes, don't ever, don't ever underestimate the power of just force and loud. He goes, I just hate loud. We're laughing. But um, we, we kind of downplay always um, the, the risk, although we ask for prayers. But we don't expect people to understand what we've done or what we do, um, because I—I I mean, can you? They don't have a basis for it. That's why I'm trying to draw it out of you. Yeah, they need to hear it. Yeah. So, what compels us is the love for kids. And this professor met with us, and you know, the first question I asked him, we're sitting down like this, and. You know, I had, and we're, I'm using the terp, and I said, who was with Delta, and I said, um, ask him if he wants to cut my head off. And I mean, this is right when people are watching on TV. He goes, boss, I don't think that's a good idea. I said, ask him. He goes, any of my security guys, and some guys you may know, because they were part of stuff, <laughs> they're like, oh, no, he's going to get us killed. But that's really, I, I said, I have to be authentic to who I am. And if God called me to meet this guy, I want So he asked him, he starts laughing. He's like, why would, why would I want to cut your head off? You're my guest. I'm bringing you here. And that's when he reiterated, we've watched you for two years. You care about our children. You're not here for military gain, oil, money. But you have a pure mission. So he goes, I'm here to help you. How can I help you? I was like, wow. I said, well, you can teach me about Islam. I don't understand the customs. He says, have you ever been to um, a mosque for worship? I said, no. He said, let's go tonight. And we left that secure place where we were, went into a mosque, huge. And, uh, and he was like, you really believe what you believe. I said, yeah. He goes, you're what we call a man of the book. And um, I said, well, I just try to live my faith best I can. Do you know because of that act of faith and trusting him, knowing, yeah, we could get smoked, wrapped up like that. There's no, there's no way we could withstand any type of coordinated attack. And um, they're going to get us. He took me 
to an abandoned place where Christians, this is when ISIS had just hit, when Christians had fled Keragos, Hamdania, and and he brings me there the next day with my team. He goes, these are Christians. These are your people. Help them. He goes, because this is wrong. I'm like, I, I will help them. We end up getting all of them out of the country. Remember all those life insurance ads on the TV and on the radio when you were a kid? Probably not, because that was your parents' job, right? Secure your family's financial plan in case of an emergency. Well, guess what? Now a lot of you are parents, and it's time for you to take into consideration the livelihood of your family's financial future if something bad were to happen. Fabric was designed by parents for parents to help you get high quality, surprisingly affordable life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. Fabric was designed by parents for parents to help you get a high quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. You could go from start to covered in literally less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. There's no risk to apply. They have a 30-day money-back guarantee and you can cancel at any time. Join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to protect their family. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash Sean. That's meetfabric.com slash Sean. M-E-E-T fabric. Dot com slash Sean. Policies issued by Western Southern Life Assurance Company, not available in certain states. Prices subject to underwriting and health questions. How many of them are there? Guys, there was like 45 in that group. And it's, as you well know, that's not a small thing to move people to a different country to get them safe and away. Um, and I mean, there were families and kids, tons of children. And then he was, that built a relationship with us. He was like, you, you really do care. And I said, of course, and it's not just Christian kids. It's Muslim children. It's kids of ISIS. Well, I, I'll never not help a kid. Uh, Yazidis, Kurds, it doesn't matter. It says children are always the one that pay the biggest price for adults' mistakes. So, and I've, I, I don't think I've ever said this, but I'm going to say it. We, have, we had many meetings. Many times I've gone, we were meeting and, you know, we were sitting having tea one time and he goes, Victor, I, you know, the name he'd call me. He goes, uh, I'd like to tell you something. I said, oh, okay, professor. He leans forward. I lean forward. He goes, would you like to know where an ISIS training camp is, a DASH training camp. I paused and I said, if you tell me this, what do you want me to do with that information? Because that's going to determine if I want to hear it or not. And he goes, kill them. Kill all of them. I said, so help me understand this. I know you rejected them wanting you to lead them spiritually under al Baghdadi, I said, but now you want a training camp and these guys to be wiped out? He said, yes. I said, why? He goes, because they're a virus. They are a virus, even to Muslims. And he goes, I, I have the coordinates and it's active right now. 
I said, well, I've got friends that are very good at what they do. I'm sure we can take care of that. And we did. And so there's been a number of things like that happen where. Um, How did it get taken care of? Uh, the information went to another group that um, the U.S. Organized a strike. Yep. Uh, there was another time I got a call, and I'm like, it's from a friend of mine, Dave Eubank. And if you've never heard or met Dave Eubank, I would tell people, watch their movie. It's a documentary. You can stream it tonight, and it's called Free Burma Rangers. And if you want to see what we were involved in, that is the documentary to watch. And although it's about Dave and his teams of high-risk missionaries and his family, um, I brought Dave in and then funded and equipped. And, you know, he's, it's unreal. Uh, it's, uh, to me, it's, it's a beautiful depiction of Christian faith and in, in, on the front lines, behind the lines of, of courage and sacrifice. And um, so, uh, yeah, with Dave, he, he, he calls me and he's like, help, we need help. I said, where are y'all? They were on a front line getting women and children out of a position. And he goes, we just, we just got attacked by ISIS. And he was with, at the time, Peshmerga. And no Americans. It's just them doing this. And I said, you know, how many are there? He goes, I, he goes I'm, I'm guessing 70. He says, it's, it's a bunch. He said, and they're, because, you know, they would come in trucks and offload and just, he goes, we can't, he goes, I don't think we could withstand them. We can't repel them. Um, he goes, do you still have, a, we call a bat number? I said, I, I do. And he sent me like a good SF guy, because he was, uh, he was at First Special Forces Group and uh, when he was in. And, uh, um, but he sent me everything, topography, location, blah, blah, everything. And so I made a call, forwarded that. And he said it was, he said the heat from the strike was so hot, they're laying down on this side of the trench because of the trench work. And he said that they, they, they toasted them, all of them. And he goes, I can't believe how, he just goes, actually, I can't believe how hot it was. And um, so there there have been decisions I made that that changed the course of things in certain situations. And um, there have been times bad guys were shooting at us and in an appropriate self-defense manner, we would shoot back. Um, I was never there to kick in doors or hunt ISIS, it's not my goal. But we had our rules of engagement of what we felt was appropriate and um, decisions we would make that um, help protect children and women. And, you know, um, I've prayed. I prayed for an ISIS fighter that got captured one night. And that was that was one of my wildest experiences, I think, dealing with ISIS face to face. <laughs> Cause he's sensed up and he's on his and he's sitting legs crossed. And um, you know, I start talking to him, just, hey man, tell me about yourself. And he ended up being a, a commander in the area. He was actually well known. And we were going in, it was late, and it was just after midnight, we we're going to, I think, pick up a kid out of Mosul. So we were in a, a staging area as a forward fob for Iraqis, and we were in a house. That's the fob. And um, this guy, I talked to him about his family. I talked to him about his kids. And and then I said, you know, why would you join ISIS? He said, pressure. He said, my brother joined. 
you know, what am I going to do as part of the tribe stay and not come fight? And he said, I, I said, okay. I said, what, what would you want me to tell young men that are being radicalized? And still to this day, it shocks me what he said. He goes, tell them don't come to the evil. Darkness, tell them don't come. I'm like, wow. We talked about some other things. And then what else did you talk about? Talked about life and death, um, his children, his wife. I said, you know, you're not going to probably live much longer. He's in Shalan. People must understand uh, we were embedded with Iraqis and their justice system there is, you know, 22 cent round. There's no. When you're in combat and heat and stuff's happening, it's unless a person really warrants it, they, you know, just put lights out on people. So I, I told him, I said, you know, can I pray for your family? He said, please, pray for his family. I said, what's going to happen to you when you die? He says, inshallah. I said. Do you mind if I share with you what I consider my security of salvation when I die? He goes, no, go ahead. And then I shared the gospel. I shared the cross, what Jesus did, and how he's the one that can forgive and pardon any one of our sins. And I explained the thieves on the cross. Uh, and or criminals, and one of them wanted to enter into paradise, Christ way, not through a false way of, you know, killing. And and I said, do you want to know you have that assurance of life after that? He goes, yes. I said, do you want to pray with me to receive Christ? He's like, yes. It's an ISIS fighter. And I mean... I'm I'm literally stunned this is happening. So he starts praying to receive Christ. And right at the end, I'll show you a picture of him. Right at the end, I said, in Jesus' name, and he stopped, and he shook his head, no. I mean, it was out of nowhere, just no. And I literally saw evil come upon this man, like an evil entity come upon him. And just like that, he broke out of his hand ties. His face contorted and his ears pinched up like a like a troll or something. And my dog was right next to him and she went for his throat. And I'm like, nah. I'm like, oh my gosh. I got her. And I mean, I, I was shocked. I was like, wait a minute. I'm just finishing prayer. And Hassan, who's my personal security when we travel overseas. Uh, he, you know, he's jumping up. He's got his gun and the Iraqi soldiers come over, time up again. And I'm just praying like, Lord, what just happened? And all of a sudden, this evil leaves him and his face stops being contorted and it gets smooth. I'm like, do you know what just happened? He was like embarrassed. Yeah, I said, that's that's not human. I was, like, I was like, my gosh, man. And I told him, well, look, there's no way that God brought me from America here and then on a mission into Mosul tonight. There's fighting everywhere. And I just explained the gospel for you that you would reject him. And I just said, you can call out to Jesus before you die, and he'll save you. I truly believe that but it has to be from your heart. And he said, thank you. And I took him away. And uh, <laughs> Hassan, he's he's quite the character. I mean, like, you know, typical Iraqi, dyes his beard, you know, and he's just like this sunglass, cool hand loop. But he used to be the personal security for a minister of finance, and his brother was killed on IED. Uh, of he better rather, and they were both security. And then he worked for the unit, and so he's got a ton of experience. But he looks at me, he goes, 
boss, I'm very sorry. He goes, I seen the evil come and run. Ah, he goes, I was going to shoot him in the face, but I'm wait, wait, cause you were saying the very nice things to him. <laughs> and I'm like, thanks for not shooting him in the face while I'm praying. That would like be the worst. Uh, you know, and poof. That's on. No, you got to wait. Uh, but that's, you know, that's how Iraqis are. Yeah. I was just like, oh, that comes to us all. So, yeah, it's, um, we still have a house there, Sean. What kind of stuff is happening to these kids? Um, we always try to find family. Tribal family is the best way. You can't adopt kids out of Iraq. You can't adopt a kid if you're not Muslim. There are prohibitions to all that. Um, many are still in camps. Um, and it's going to turn into generational stuff like Palestine, where there'll be perpetual victims. Um, and it's very sad what happened. Um, and it could have been stopped a lot sooner. Um, but there's always, I mean, if governments can benefit from war, they will. And they'll even sacrifice their own people. I think we've all figured that out. Yeah. Especially this country. Yeah. What I meant was, what's happening to those kids before you get there? Depends on where, what time frame, what's going on. Everything from they're hiding with their parents and their parents are murdered um, to um, they've been abducted by ISIS. Bad things happen. Things that people don't, they don't need to know. They don't want to know. And I remember I kept one video of a kid. It, it, it got sent to me in an area that we were working. And uh, ISIS killed the parents. And this little baby, so toddler, they left him by a garbage can. And... He's covered with flies. He's got a diaper that's, you know, old. And people look at this video, and you think you're looking at a dead baby, and then it moves. And then you hear ISIS fighters laughing. And kids have seen the worst. They've seen their parents beheaded, shot. They watch other kids get burned alive on in fires, or one case, it was a like an outdoor oven, just to reinforce fear. Um, the last girl we had in our house had been held captive for seven years, and um, she was a sex slave. So we Here's what's amazing about the resilience of kids. She's, she's sitting in our living room at our house in Iraq, our safe house, and she's smiling. I'm like, why are you smiling? She goes, I'm free. She's got a broke nose, her back is busted. And she's like, I'm, I'm free. And y'all are helping me. No one else is. And um, Rosa, could you give them all names? We reunited nine mothers with 12 children. Um, they had separated ISIS, had separated the moms for sex slaves, and then the children were somewhere else. And um, we got them together for the first time. They, then they all stayed at our house. And, um, but, Probably the hardest situation. We have ongoing cases, individual, hard to reach. We, you know, we made a promise we would never stop searching for girls who are still being held. And we never publicly make stuff known. But there's a girl we've been looking for for three years and we found her. She's been held. 
when we started looking for her, she had already been held for two years, so six years. And my team goes, they call. I'm like, boss, we found her. She's such a high-value target within the organization of ISIS that they put out a full story in a Turkish newspaper that said her name and that she had been rescued. That's wow. That's complete false. Why is she such a target? Why is she so important to them? Well, she's the last Christian girl that was kidnapped. And they brainwashed her so good. She's recruiting girls to to be vest, you know, suicide and suicide bombers. Yeah, she's so good at recruiting. And my guys, they they call me one time, and it's, and it's like how long ago. And like we found her, we've got eyes on her. We've been monitoring. I said, "What's the risk assessment to get her?" And they go, "Bloody, but we can do it." And I said, well, "You know, what type of casualties, a loss of life?" And they go, "You know, it's it's gonna be, it's gonna be bloody." There's, and then he goes, "Do you want my opinion?" And I need people to understand this. This is this is not American guy talking. They're indigenous, and uh, CJ goes, let me kill her. He says it's better for everybody, including her. So I prayed and I told him, I said, you know, I, I, I can't say yes to that or I still, there's hope. And then they moved her and we know where she is right now. And, um, we actually got a video for her mom, from her mom, begging her to please come. And um, this is the type that requires prayer. Because even if you get them out, it, some people are so damaged emotionally. It's, it's, it's tough. They so identify with what they've been brainwashed by. So, you know, again, the normal people and even Christians, they don't understand how nasty and dark this world is and what we deal with when decisions you have to make and, you know, our goal is always to set the captive free physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And that's just the Middle East. Every country, every region has its own rules. And, um, you know, um, it's, it's ugly. It's an ugly ministry that's needed. And um, we're all about, again, setting captives free physically when they need it, emotionally and spiritually. Um, but that, that, um, that's caused a lot of people to not like my wife and I. And um, we don't care. That's our job. Like my wife said, <laughs> My wife said, as we're about to pump into a really bad situation, Eileen looks at me and goes, what's the worst that can happen? We die? 
I'm like, yeah, Dad. She goes, but then don't we win, honey? Because we're going to heaven. I'm like, dang. You really believe in this stuff, like, at a whole different level. I mean, I believe when we're dying, but I, you know, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to the great grandpa death. Palms, kids, you know. I, and my wife is like, we follow God's will. And if we die, it's his. It's his will, not man's. Because she literally believes it doesn't matter how many times we're. One day, I counted 30 mortars shot at us on a movement. movement. I stopped counting at 30. I'll put it to you that way. And I'm just like, and again, we understand. That's why I tell people, if we're ever killed or rolled up or something, I hope to the good Lord nobody thinks we made a mistake or the enemy won instead of just saying, wow, they died well. They died They died doing what if you want to. Um, again, <laughs> and people have to understand all these pumps and missions were all done in my 50s. So God's hands on us and now we're developing out teams. And you know one of the hardest places to do this work is the U.S. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Because rules that only work for criminals. Do you think that the U.S. government has... Do they want to solve this problem? Not at all. Do you think that's why the rules are there? Mm-hmm. I, I believe there are good men and women in every part of our government. But they're probably a minority. I think they're definitely a minority. Yeah. <laughs> Without a I'm being nice. ounce of doubt. Yeah. So they're limited. It's like uh, it's like when you're on the teams. Can you imagine going on target and getting an order that says your rules of engagement are this? Don't even lock and load. Like what the hell? Are you kidding me? In America, we could be getting a lot more pedophiles. The problem it's so much bigger than people know. From what I understand, the U.S. is the largest consumer of underage pornography. Yeah. It, we call it child porn. Uh, the technical term is CSAM, child sexual abuse material, because it's all child abuse. And um, there were over 33 million images transferred or downloaded Um last year and our Justice Department throughout the entire U.S. just over 300 cases were prosecuted. I also have heard well not not heard from the he was attached to the Department of Homeland Security said that there are I believe he said there are 6,000 law enforcement officers in the world, in the world, that are actively combating child sex crimes, yeah. exploitation. I, I would say that's accurate in the world. Um, here's what people need to understand here in the U.S. Um, departments, and we've worked with, I mean, it, Local departments, Homeland Security, um, we've worked with FBI. We've worked with major groups, right? I can tell you this. Um, they're overworked, underfunded, and undertrained. I mean, even, even, I just, there are so many things that don't add up to me. You know, let's talk about 
let's talk about adoption. Right. And I have several friends who are active, who can have children, Mm -hmm. who are actively trying to adopt an American child. Now, what, about a year ago? And this isn't, I'm not getting into politics here. Right, right. This is just, this is just facts. Straight truth, yep. You know, a year, year ago, they overturned Roe versus Wade. Right. Which means there are going to be ton of kids. A ton of kids going up for adoption. Yep. But nobody seems to be able to find out how to adopt an American child. Now why where are all of these orphans who are being put up into an, in put up for adoption? Where are they going? Why is it that we have to adopt kids from wherever? Ukraine, right. China, right. Haiti. Not I'm not saying that's bad. I'm right. just saying mm-hmm. Why can't we adopt an American child? Where are they all going? Yeah. We just overturned Roe versus Wade. That means there are a lot of unwanted babies yeah. in this country that nobody wants to take care of. Well, not nobody. There's a ton of people out there who want to adopt and they are unable to adopt. Why the f- can they not adopt a f- American kid? Where the f- are they going? The system. It's not broken, it's rigged. That's why we can't account for 85,000 children that have crossed the border, of which some, my wife and I, were right there helping them get out of the water because they made a three-month, nine-month, whatever journey. And we're looking at these kids. Remember looking at two sisters, both under 11, and when they finally crossed over, it was that night, we were embedded with the uh, border control and then also, you know, a reserve unit. And I'll never forget, they came off this little raft. When they felt safe, my wife just grabbed them and they both started bawling. And... 85,000 of these children are missing. Uh, The system is not broken. It's rigged. Where when a kid gets out of the unaccompanied children's camps, the government set it up where you're only allowed to try to find them one time. One time. After that, There is no monitoring. There's no, it's again, it's so overwhelmed. Like Child Protective Services, CPS is, they're beyond broken. And the goal is children more than anything else. The goal, because if you can, if you can break a child, man, it's a lifetime of trauma even get them to function properly. Uh, I I believe there are so many pedophiles in the U.S. um, that it's beyond not safe anymore. And that's why we've started this new initiative, starting with a think tank. And then we've just started a task force. And um, it's... People can find it on our website. We call it the Pedophile Hunter Fund, where we won't take any government money. We're privately funded. And it um, doesn't matter if you're Democrat, Republican, Independent, Christian, Atheist, Buddhist. It doesn't matter. We're coming for you. If you hurt a child, if you use anything that's related to hurting children, in a sexual way, yeah. And that's why law enforcement is important, district attorneys are important, and we're bypassing the system in some degree with our own private teams to do the hardest work. And it's not for it's not for sensationalism, because a lot of times you can out a person, but that doesn't mean they're gonna get prosecuted. We're going for prosecution. And um, and then also other things I can't share right now, 
but I will in an update that I'm just telling parents, you have no clue how bad it is. Hey guys, let me tell you about this subscription service that I've been working real hard on called Vigilance Elite Patreon. Basically on Patreon, we have it broken up into three different tiers. We got tier one, tier two, and tier three. Let's dive in. Our tier one patrons get all the behind the scenes footage of the Sean Ryan show. That could include behind the scenes photos, that could be side conversations that we have in between breaks, that could be specific questions that our patrons give us for the guest on the Sean Ryan show, and a ton of bonus content that doesn't really fit into any specific category. For our tier two patrons, they get access to our tactical training library, which consists of well over a hundred videos. We've broken those videos up into separate categories, and those categories are rifle fundamentals, pistol fundamentals, drills, tactics, driving, gear and weapon setups, and everybody's favorite, mindset. Also on tier two, you will get a live update from me on the 1st and the 15th of every month where we talk about the upcoming guests on the Sean Ryan Show, plus all the benefits of tier one. Our top tier, which is tier three, gets full access to all the other tiers, plus they get full access to me where we do video teleconferencing, VTC, once a month. We discuss anything from tactics to current events to who's coming on the show. I take suggestions and it's very interactive. No matter what tier you choose, the support is greatly appreciated and it is the only thing that makes this show drive on. So thank you for all the support. See you on Patreon. So one thing parents really don't understand is how absolutely dangerous it is right now. And it's to the point where you shouldn't be vigilant, you should be hypervigilant. And I don't use that term lightly, but that's the state our nation is in um, regarding the safety of our children and welfare. I, I'll give this, one of the fastest growing groups of people viewing child sexual abuse images are um, young men in their 20s. And people think, how is that possible? Well, it's because of porn. Because when you start looking at porn or 8, 9, 10, 11 years old, which is who they target, they've been targeting kids for a long time, you get desensitized to regular porn, and it goes into these fetishes and extreme, extreme to where now a guy in his 20s cannot derive sexual pleasure unless it's so perverted. And that's when, boom. That's why I just. That's why I just got into a, a, you know, a situation with a conservative leader, who was interviewed by First Peterson and um, then a, a, a Catholic fella, who it was a good interview. But the guy asked me, he goes, so, what do you think about AI child porn? Which. If people understand that, that's literally, you can take images of children's. I've heard about this. Yeah. And l literally, it's so, it's so messed up right now that an image of your child on the internet that you're trying to show people on social media, they can take, they can take the face of your child and make a porn movie with your child animated or animated or just this artificial intelligence that everything's real. You can't tell the difference. Then they can insert themselves into this porn film. That's what AI, the danger of it in that realm, um, that's what the strike is about right now uh, in Hollywood. What is it? it? It's There's this long strike that's been going to where uh, Screen Actors Guild, uh, writers, uh, What's happening in Hollywood is they're starting to, they're wanting to pay for the image of actors like um, Harrison Ford. 
take his image, AI it, and make a movie with him in it, but him never having to walk on set. And you won't be able to tell the difference. And um, so some actors are like, that's that's cool. Other actors are, no. And then extras will only work one time because once their image is done, they're out of work. They've paid a small fee, uh, or got paid a small fee for their likeness. So this is where it's going. And uh, my deal was with Dennis Prager, who's who's Jewish, a conservative, but he said on this interview that he doesn't find it's evil for a man to masturbate to animated child porn. That's alarming. This is a... a That's well, a real human being saying that? It's a real human being. And he's one of the most popular conservative talk hosts. When, when did that come out? Uh, that came out three months ago. People listen to this guy? Oh, big time. He's considered one of the, yeah, that's why I say, I don't care, conservative, liberal. Now, I believe a lot of the laws are being passed on the liberal side and extreme left uh, because they are into openly perversion. and a, uh, But perversion's everywhere. When this guy said that, I literally made a video, played his clip in context, and I said, this man is creating pedophiles because he just gave a liberty and a license for young men to watch animated child porn. Does he not understand what conditioning the mind is? For such a smart guy, supposedly he didn't because the video I made went viral. And um, it, they, it apparently hurt them, his organization, which is a nonprofit. Oh, and well, that's too bad. Yeah. So I got a call from <laughs> his executive person. Uh, oh, he didn't call you his executive no. called? Oh, heck no. Of course. Yeah. No. And I said, look, there's two things you need to do. The hair on the back of my neck is standing up yeah. right now. And, and here's what's more alarming. People his get, executive called you to yeah. what? Uh, speak for him? Well, it was his CEO of the organization, and they said, uh, and it was a female, and I'm like, wow, dude, you're just, because I on the video I said, I'll debate you on this issue, and uh, or you can interview me, whatever you want, because he has a big talk show, radio talk show. And I said, I'm risking losing a book deal because it's by the same publisher. Uh, I have a book coming out called The Dangerous Gentleman in February. And I'm like, this is one of their key guys. And I'm, I don't care. I don't care. I'm more concerned about children and this conditioning of the mind. So I said, all you have to do is recant what you said and repent. Period. Because he's written things on the Old Testament. And a lot of Christians really appreciate this guy. And... I think he's I think he's pompous in my opinion. This is arrogant guy that's lived in a bubble that has an experienced life and and then for him to for him to give the nod of and literally his words were uh the guy asked him, Do you think you can't call this evil if a man is masturbating to animated child porn? He goes, No. No, I can't. And good on the host, the host looks at him and goes, a good Catholic dude, he goes, that's despicable. And his response was, really? Why? And I'm like, so here, here was the most disturbing. That's the end of the conversation. Yeah. That's it. But he actually doubled down to say, if look. He doesn't understand why. Yeah. I mean, how, how do you even, exp how do you... Well, his position was that no one's hurt. There's no victims in this. And I'm going, wow, you you are a stupid man. And I said, if you're really that, I mean, if you really don't get that, talk to me. Uh, I'll, uh, talk to me. So, of course, he never did. He called other people. And then his CEO called me, and I'm just like, what did the CEO say? Like, uh, what does that conversation look like? 
Uh, I would like to excuse. What? what, what oh no! It? it was. What do you have against us? You like kitty porn. You're, That's what we yeah, got to get yeah. out against you. You're destroying our organization. I said, what does destroying or hurting, whatever the term was, you know, um, your organization, what does that mean? And this was this is what she said. Our donations have dropped tremendously. And I'm like, and there you have it. That's what it goes back to again is money and donations and they did this now they did a they did a cleanup campaign where he's being interviewed by different people and he's like okay i didn't realize how bad animated child porn is and it can affect people and you know i'm like wow uh, so he never apologized he 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 only said and he wouldn't use my name he just goes people out there are taking my words out of context I'm like, it was the clip. So this is what I'm trying to tell people and parents. It's a lot worse than you think. When you have one of the top radio shows in the nation of the top conservative sharing that his position, he couldn't call it evil. And again, he tried to justify it and, you know, Jewish position. And he, you know, and, and I get all that, but I at least say it's disgusting at least say, no, no one should be doing that. No one should be, you know. I mean, it sounds like he's condoning it. it I, I said, you're, I said it. I said, you're given a liberty and a license for young men or men to go, well, if he says it's, uh, so now he's recanted everything, but, uh, you know, I can't judge a man's heart, just his words. And he certainly ain't repentive to me. It was damage control because they're losing money. But this is my point, because I don't want to make this political, is when it comes time for perversion, it's across the board. And let's start with Christians. I would tell parents watching this, don't put your child in a daycare or a Christian, you know, sunny school classroom unless the church requires not only a background check, which everybody knows, but a poly. I would absolutely require a forensic polygraph examiner to come in for volunteers. And that's one question uh, I would say, too, is have you ever fantasized about any sexual things with about children? And two, have you looked at any type of um, images or child pornography, sexual, you know, in, in the last year. Guess what? They're going to they're gonna find a lot of volunteers not wanting to volunteer. Yeah. And, and pastors play ignorant by saying, well, we do a background check. I'm like, that does nothing for a person who's never been caught. You don't know the increase and the rise of downloads, production of, distribution, and people don't realize that 86%, I think the numbers right now is 86% of all child porn looked at, transferred, these sexual images is done at work. And um, and it's people using their work's IP address or the, it's, it's an addiction. Mm -hmm. And the sad thing is we cannot right now, we can't arrest our way out of this. Yeah, you know, it's... I covered a lot of some of I, I I interviewed this guy, you know him, Ryan Montgomery. Yeah. And um Good guy. Found a Instagram clip on mm -hmm. what he was doing. Nobody would give this guy the time of day. Nope. And uh brought him out here. It's a it turned out to be the biggest interview I've ever done in my life. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and I'm I'm happy. You oh know, because gosh. that interview yes. saved a saved more kids. Sure than, did. Then you and I will sure ever did. be able to count. And and what I wanted to do with that interview was I wanted to make it real. I mean, I I wanted to, I didn't want to make it real, but I wanted to understand because you hear these things, you know, you hear, right. oh, they're in the they're in Instagram, they're in TikTok, they're in the chat rooms, they're on Facebook, Snapchat, Xbox, PlayStation, computer games, you anywhere. The kids are online. 
I've heard, you know, that these the predators are there. And they're hunting. And so I needed to see this, you know, because I'm I am a I have to see to believe yeah. a lot of times, you know. And uh I mean, even with my faith. Yeah. Know, I mean, I don't know if you've listened to the yeah, episode, yeah. but um like it it it's I'm just that guy. I've got to see to believe. It's hard for me to take anybody's word. So Ryan's sitting there and I said, Hey, you at your laptop here? And he said, Yeah. I said, just pull your laptop out, get in any chat room. I don't care, social media platform, whatever you want. And I want to see how long this Show takes. Me. It was like five seconds. It's crazy. Made the screen name Ashley 13, New Jersey. I'll never forget it. The, he goes, oh, got one right here. And I'm like, I couldn't even have typed the name that fast and right. the user, you know, the username that right. fast. And and as the conversation developed, there it is. I think it was a 47-year-old man wanting to get with a 13-year-old yeah. girl. Yep. And right there just proved to... However many people watch that episode. Millions. You know what I mean? Um, it, it was one of the most convincing clips. And and so people understand, too, Ryan is such a solid guy. He's actually both on our think tank and part of our task force. Good. Good. And, he, I mean, he'll help. He, he does work with other people, too. But he had one of the most convincing positions by proof on your program that changed, I think it changed our nation, where people went, oh my gosh. This is real. And like the next step of that is for people to understand, it's not some creepy, it's not just creepy weird dude in a yeah. basement. It's doctors, it's lawyers, it's government officials. I mean. It's it, the white collar, white man crime. It is. That's what it is. And, and, and um, I'm just going to say it how Because there's is. no community anymore. You know, it, there's just, there's no community anymore. Man, this child pedophilia, it leans toward, I mean, we have operations in other countries. I can show you, I can show you right now uh, a photo of a, a four-year-old girl who we have in our custody who was being raped by foreigners, by the grandfather. And uh, two days ago, she went to court to testify. Can you imagine that? To be able to testify. And she went down to the courthouse, and one of the abusers showed up. A white dude, older dude that can go over there. And uh, we're actually running facial recognition on him uh, as we speak because... It's it's beyond the brazenness of evil is beyond what people can imagine, beyond what people can imagine. Do you think this problem is getting worse, or is the veil just being lifted? It's getting worse. It's getting worse. Yeah, because of technology. Because my abuser as a kid. He had dirty magazines, but to get uh, uh, to get child pornography, that was a physical. That was a physical something you had to hold. You couldn't email it. You couldn't go online. There was no online. There's no internet now. What would take a sailor a lifetime of traveling to see and learn about an eighth grader can on his phone in one night? That's why it's. It has sped up the process of absolutely destroying the minds of our children. Not a sailor, but our children. And that's what people aren't willing to accept and understand. I think they're starting to. Yeah. I think they're starting to. I think, I think this is waking a lot of parents up. You know, I really do. But um, this kind of brings me into, I mean, look, nothing, 
it's it's getting to the point where nothing is making sense and i'm even starting you know it how do i say this i think political barriers are starting to be torn down mm-hmm. because it was a it was a it, it's an illusion it's a man-made illusion that these are party lines. Yes, I agree with you that, yes, the left is, the far left is trying to legalize pedophilia. Yeah. You know. But there are guys on the right that won't fight against it. We've plenty people on the right. And we have, we have had plenty, you know, and I'm guilty of this. I'm guilty of politicizing this. Right. You know, I'm not going to lie. And, um. Well, not too bad, but I fell for it. I fell for the bait, I guess is what I'm saying. And uh, I thought this was a political thing. This isn't a political thing. This is everywhere. And, and yeah, what I was fed was all political. This is all the left. Then I interviewed this guy. This interview hasn't even come out yet. I ne- interviewed this guy who followed Epstein around for 20 years. Mm. And... um so that'll be coming out hopefully mm. shortly. But he had talked about a scandal called the Franklin scandal. Have you heard of this? Mm-mm. It was in Nebraska. And uh it was a it was a, a a child sex trafficking ring that was all conservatives back in the Oh 90s. yes. Oh yeah, proven. Yeah. Yep, done. Like, Absolutely proven. Documented. Yeah, no conspiracy. Yeah, factual. It happened. Oh yes, yes. And that, uh, there's a, he wrote a book on it. Yep. And um, and I mean it's happening. It's happening right. One of the biggest rings ever to be busted was right here in Williamson County. Now supposedly this is the 19th safest county to live in right. in the country. If I remember, it was. It's like top. Yeah. Top twenty, whatever. Who cares? Top fifty. I yeah. don't even. I don't even. You know what I mean? There's a lot of counties. Yeah. Biggest, biggest sex trafficking ring in the country. One of the biggest ones in the country busted right here. How is this the safest county? Yeah. Give me a break. There's no safe places. You know. And, That's an illusion. And, you know, and there's so many other things that are happening that make zero sense. The 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 gender issues that were spe- you want to do that stuff when you're 18 years old right. I don't care right I don't think anybody really cares right might make people uncomfortable do you do but I don't think they really care but you start doing that to eight year old kids you know you see these you see these A list celebrities with three sons and yeah. I uh, all three of them want to be all three of them just happen to want to be little girls. Girls. I'm not buying that shit. No way. Nobody's buying that. Well, some people are. You know, and but there's that. There's I mean ev- everywhere you look, it's upside down and a lot of people still think this is political. This isn't political. I think this is I think this is a legitimate battle of good versus evil, spiritual warfare. And I am very green on this topic, but it just doesn't make sense. You know, I know people who are liberal, who are great people, you know, and I'll probably get a bunch of shit (laughs) for saying that on this platform, but I'll tell you, my, the therapist that I give credit to saving my life Mm. and just about every spec operator who sat in that chair Mm. has talked to her as well. She's helped thousands of, of tier one spec ops guys Mm. get VA benefits, walk them through, talk them out of the, talk them out of, I mean, just about as far left as you can. Well, I shouldn't say she's a lefty. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. Amazing human being. The woman that I interviewed who got the the four Blackwater guys. Yeah. She she's the one that got Trump's attention to pardon these guys for being innocent, you know. Mm. 
a liberal woman. So this is a major, this is a conservative audience here, but right. I'm here to tell you like the veil's been, the, the, mm -hmm. you got to lift it. Yeah. We're yeah. not that far apart. He, and, and that's part of the messaging to make everybody so far apart. And we're dealing with humanity. And I agree with you a thousand percent. What people need to understand, there's an unseen war at the highest level. And it is truly between good and evil. And the angels are involved and so are demons. Because out of everything I do, everything we've talked about today, probably the most important thing we do is deal with the demonic. And again, our mission statement to set people free, kids especially, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And until you get really set free in the spiritual realm, uh, there's unneeded suffering, there's unneeded drivenness, there's unneeded addictions, there's unneeded torment. And a person really, um, and it's just of late in our culture that that's all been separated out and like dismissed. People, cultures you go around, people believe in evil. You start talking about here in the U.S.? No, 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 well, you know. Other countries, like, of course, of course. And um, I, I've seen it. We've dealt with it. And I can tell you, it's what makes sense out of all the craziness that is one higher level of demonic activity driving people in the battlefields in their mind. And I do believe that a person's soul, which I would consider his mind, will, and emotions, can be assaulted by a demon entity. Now, I'm not talking about possession. Uh, I don't even use the word possession because I think that's what the devil, who's the, the highest fallen angel, Satan, I believe that's what he wants people to think, that unless you're manifesting, crawling walls, vomiting, what movies are made out of, then a person goes, well, I don't have any issues with demons because that's not happening to me. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, there's that's simply not true. And why do mothers kill their children? Why does a teacher and her husband, who's a police officer, um, literally make cupcakes for her to take to her classroom, children, and kids were getting sick, but parents, some came up, they end up finding out that they were putting this man's semen in the cupcakes, and she was giving it to the kids. Yeah, both convicted. And um, why, why does, you know, uh, a good Christian staff member at a church in San Diego, a well-known church um, in San Diego, uh, her husband is a former Border Patrol, and they're Christian-going people. Why were they charged with the death of foster kids they took in who were beaten in malnutrition? Their evil has to be brought into this equation and I believe people's hearts can be desperately wicked. Uh, but when they yield themselves to evil, when they yield themselves to demonic activity, the only way out is to be free. And you can't wish that away. Uh, I believe there are times you just got to be prayed for. Because that's how we deal with the demonic is through prayer. And um, I'll say this. We actually have a documentary, an eight-part docu-series coming out um, soon, and it explains really what warfare is, spiritual warfare. It explains the tactics, the strategies, but the greatest thing, it actually teaches people their authority, how to stand against and not be a victim of demonic attacks. Well, what is it? So, How would you define spiritual warfare? Yeah, I think it is a battle between good and evil, demonic, the devil, God and his angels, 
But the prize is actually humans. That's who they're going after. Is it souls? Souls, ultimately, that's the biggest thing. But if they can't get a soul, then they'll just destroy God's creation. They'll destroy something God loves, and he loves people. Uh, and that's their goal, to ruin their life, to make them miserable, to cause divorces, to create addictions, to lie in a person's mind enough where a kid goes, I think I sh- am a girl, you know, or a girl saying, I want my breast cut off because I feel like a boy. This is this is a new phenomenon. This never happened in the history of the world. Yeah. Um, and it just goes on and on, the destruction of the family, fentanyl deaths. It just, there, there's an evil that is active and working, and people need to understand the only way you can fight it is through the power of Christ, the blood of Jesus, and your authority in who you are. And I've dealt with thousands of demons now, thousands, easily. How do you think this ends? I think the Bible is true. I think that uh, we're on a timetable of what's happening through prophecies being fulfilled in the Bible. Um, and I think we're we're heading towards certain, it's, it's a certain absolute unchangeable destination of the world yielding itself to the Antichrist. And for the Antichrist to rule, people have to be willing subjects by and large. And I told people, and I mean it, if as bad as cancer is, let's just say cancer is the worst thing in the world, or child abuse, as bad as those things are, if we use those two, or let's say divorce, you know, for people who hate divorce or adultery, whatever. Think of the worst pain. If it all if it all could be solved in one week, cancer's a cure. No more children will be abused. Those are like just unmistakable, right? Those aren't religious issues. Those are just human issues. But the requirement would be for everyone to stop using their cell phone. And that's impossible. It's impossible because of the human heart. I'm convinced that it's just people feel like they're preparing for the worst and they're going to overcome it. And and I'm like, you're just building a sandcastle in the devil's sandbox. When he comes with his water hose, there's nothing you can do. And they're definitely... I mean, the enemy has a legal right to some people who yield themselves. So uh, it's— What do you mean by that? Well, uh, the Bible says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Uh, The Bible is very clear that if a person is in rebellion to God, if they embrace sin, uh, it does open them up to to the works of darkness. And— it's very snaky at first. In some cases, in other cases, it's just blatant. I have interviewed and talked with and met with more violent chronic offenders in the juvenile system than anybody else in the country. The top three to five percent. Your mass shooters, your rapists, your baby killers, all of it. And um and it and it, it boils down to this. Evil is acceptable. Nowadays in our society, that's that's the slow frog in the kettle, and it's slowly being warmed up. He's swimming around, swimming around, and it's not boiling yet. He's not worried, and then by the time it gets to a boiling point, he's dead. It's too late. That's what's happened to the human mind and our heart, and it's because of television. It's because of movies. It's because of music. And it's because of social media, the internet, that cell phone. And people will not give it up. Um, So, like, I was in Burma. Uh, We we did a 
a month long mission inside Burma. You know, bad stuff happening, trying to help good people. And I remember laughing, going, if a person says they have a porn problem, let them come here. Because you ain't getting reception. You ain't looking at porn. You'll find out how much you don't. Um, it, it's, it's what our culture set up. The Bible says that Satan is the god of this world. Small g. So he runs it. He controls it. It's, it's not Schwab. It's not Soros. It's not WF. Those are all puppets and pawns of the wicked one. And I believe they yield themselves to evil. And he's happy to oblige. Then he has a legal right to have people do his bidding. And I've seen it again and again and again. What do you do if you're on the good side of this? What can people do? Well, you get excited about the ultimate outcome, not the temporary and the ultimate outcome is heaven for those of us who want to believe the truth of God's word and know that he's made a way of escape, including temptation. Uh, the Bible says there's no temptation that's not common to all mankind that God actually hasn't given us a way out of. So there's a truth and a power in that to go, I can live far above, um, you know, my the base human nature. Um, and when people like, when people say, you know, I look at porn, it's not a big deal. I'm like, well, there's different types. You got, you got people who are exploring. You get people who struggle like, oh, I shouldn't look at that, but every once in a while they do. You got people who are addicted. I mean, it's ruining their life. It will destroy their marriage. Uh, it will take them to dark, dark places. And, and it's like, well, if you just believe the truth that the power of God's in you, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, you don't have to be a slave to anything, anything. So the good news is we can occupy until we die or until Christ comes back. That's the good news. But we live with a purpose knowing ultimately we're fighting a spiritual battle for the hearts and minds of kids, women, children, uh, humanity. And that's always our ultimate goal. But yet I never force it. I've never had one Muslim friend feel like that I was trying to help a kid in order to present Jesus in the gospel. Never. Never. I, I was like, you know why? Because I wouldn't want anybody doing that to my kids or my grandchildren. So I think we can live a life. I'll never forget, I just finished a firefight. Um, Again, as a missionary going into a ISIS-controlled village that they've had for three years, and we know there's women and children in there, so we embedded with uh, this Iraqi force. Boom, we hit this town, this little village. Uh, all hell's breaking loose. And, you know, when there was a law, of course, it's lunchtime. So, you know, people eat. I'm leaning against the wall, and there's a guy next to me. Somebody actually took a picture. We're leaning against the wall. He looks at me and he goes, why are you here? It's only you and one other American, Dave Eubank, that are on this mission. Why are you here? And I said, well, God loves me. And I love him. But he's given me a love for you and your people. And I think all women and children should be protected from evil. So we're here to help. That guy, his eyes started leaking. And he's like, you really believe your faith? I, go, I do. And because I believe in evil. And I believe that ISIS as an organization and their leaders are evil because of what they do. And again, it doesn't matter what country or region or realm I'm in. I always try to look at it at the highest level. And then I would encourage people, come to faith, grow in faith. Just like if you want to be good at anything, you got to be intentional. And you can never go wrong just spending time reading the Word. I listen to it more than reading 
because of TBI and whatnot. And like last night, I listened half of the New Testament in the first two books in the old because I just play it. I want my brain to be soaked in that, right? But um, and then learn, learn the strategies of the enemy, and learn how you can defeat any demon in hell or all of them coming at you. That's and that's what's lacking in the Western Church today. Where would you start to to educate yourself on defeating them, the evil? Yeah. The first thing is to learn your identity in Christ. You know, if you hyper-focus on the devil and demons, it's almost like counterfeit money. Uh, bank people, vault people who are going through cash, they're not looking for a counterfeit. They're just focusing because they know the real thing so well as they're just pouring through it, da 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 da, da. A counterfeit will, will sticks out. Oh, blaring. But if they're trying to look for the counterfeit, and that's the same thing in the spiritual realm. Don't focus on demons or the devil. Focus on the Lord and learn your identity. Because if you stay close with the Lord, if you grow, then when you get a thought, remember that's the battlefield. You may see it manifest in people. And and I have I've had demons speak to me through people. I hate you. I know who you are. I'll destroy you, your family, your ministry. Uh, you know, I had one, <laughs> had one, just start saying I'm effing. I will effing kill you. I will murder you. I'm like, shut up. No, you won't. You're being judged right now. Stop using this man's voice. And. Um, the, the, when you learn your position and your power in Christ, you don't fear demons. I had a, it was a spec op guy. He, he was a tier one dude. And he launched at me. Um, he was struggling so bad. He was suicidal and all that. I start praying for him. And when I asked this demon its name, this guy had launched at me. From me to you, and I mean, <laughs> I thought I was about to have to do the tango with a dang demon um, because rare cases, but people can yield themselves and the devil even will manifest through them, rare. Uh, but halfway to me, I promise you, and I have witnesses, him being the main one, it was like an angel grabbed him by the scruff of his neck and slammed him right in front of me. He hit his knees so hard, and he's growling, and I'm like, demon, you release this man. You have no right in the name of Jesus. And this demon's like, you can't have him. I said, well, you don't own him. You just tricked him. And the guy gets set free in like five minutes. And he was like, what the hell was that? I said, we call it freedom. It's the highest form of battle you can ever get into. Eddie Penny talks a lot about this stuff, too. Does he? Oh, yeah. You guys need to meet. It's real. And once you know how to crush demons and set people free for the warrior, you're like, oh, yeah. Because you really can destroy demons. And um, so people know me as a pedophile hunter. We got patches, but in reality, I'm really hunting demons. Good for you, man. <laughs> the world needs it. We need a lot more people like you. Well, I hope, I hope we can produce a bunch before it's my time to go. Well, I hope this helps. But, Victor, this has been a phenomenal interview. And... uh I know it wasn't easy for you, and I just want to say thank you for for opening up like that. And um, to me and my audience, and I think a lot of good is going to come from this. A lot of edu education is going to come from this. Yeah. A lot of hope is going to be sparked in a lot of young people's lives who are going through a tough time because of this. And, um, man, it's just a real honor to know you and and, uh, and have you here. So well, thank you. 
You're welcome, and thanks for having me. I appreciate your friendship and your brotherhood. Me too. Let's stay in touch. We will. Cheers, brother. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.